I would like to introduce two of our panel members and ask them to uh, come up and take their place at the table. Amanda Bailey of Planet Wild. Uh, do you get that? It's the most wonderful uh, double meaning. Uh, Amanda is a landscape architect and she co-founded the company with uh, Jeffrey Rothfeder to address the pervasive reduction in biodiversity in the suburban landscape, a serious problem uh, propelled by the lawn culture in America. I think we all know we love our green lawns, but they're not so good for us. Uh, I know up close the passion and abiding commitment to her work, which will be uh, borne out by the projects that she'll describe. Okay, um, Planet Wild is a new BRA member, so welcome to Amanda. And Danny Glazer, whom I bet the room knows, Danny Glazer, I associate her with the Green Business Partnership. But Danny is also the founder and CEO of Green Team Spirit LLC, which she uh, founded to inspire after discovering from case studies of large global organizations that companies who were successful incorporating environmental sustainability into their core mission were those that combined strong executive support, a diverse green team, and systems for measuring and tracking results. So many of us here do know you through Green Business Partnership, and welcome, I'm delighted that you're here. Um, and Green Business Partnership, as you know, is a public-private partnership between the uh, Business Council of Westchester and Westchester County Government. So those are my two introductions, and um, now Jeff is going to introduce Peter. And all right. <laughs> and Michael, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Michael Murphy. <laughs> Who is Michael Murphy? Michael Murphy. <laughs> Every everyone knows Michael Murphy. <laughs> Michael Murphy is really iconic in our county. He's in business development at Murphy Brothers Contracting. Murphy Brothers, by the way, is celebrating its 40th anniversary in serving the Westchester and Hudson Valley, as well as the Southern Fairfield County region. That, that is an accomplishment. That really is. So congratulations to Murphy Brothers and, of course, Michael Murphy. Murphy Brothers is involved in building and renovating designed custom homes, private clubs, equestrian facilities, and really, a really, really diverse group of award-winning really light commercial projects. Uh, Murphy's Brothers Murphy's Brothers has always believed in building green is simply building smart. Michael represents Murphy Brothers while sitting on the Board of Trustees of the Building and Realty Institute and he is also a Vice President of the Remodelers Advisory Council. You all know Peter Gato as well. He has worked with us in our continuing dialogue with the Westchester Mid-Hudson Chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Peter is a partner at Peter F. Gato & Associates. Peter F. Gato & Associates is an architecture, engineering, planning, and construction management firm and a longtime member of the Builders Institute. It was founded in 1972 and has really grown into a large, talented team in designing sustainability responsible ways that really exceed client expectations. Most clients say that about Peter Gato's company. Those, the company strives to save the environment, nurture healthy lifestyles, and promote goodwill while providing sustainable education, saving energy, and returns on its clients' investment situations, okay? Peter F. Gato is a green business partnership company. That is our panel, that's an all-star panel. Please welcome our panel. And Maggie, who would you like to go first? Well, uh, Danny, how about if we hear from you first? Sure. All right, and then we'll just go down the line and then we'll take questions. Uh, I have a few. Um, when you're done, each of you can certainly take as long as you want to uh, tell us all about what you do, which I think is some of the most important things that is being done anywhere. So um, I think of Westchester County as a real leader in this, and you can verify that. So take it away. Get up or do uh, yes, I think probably it's good if you come up okay. here so okay. that uh, everyone hears every word you say. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me tonight. It's great. 
you, Lisa, for Dasco and our wonderful member, New Crystal Restoration. You guys are true, true green. And one of these days we're going to get you fully certified, but love having you in the program. Um, and everybody on the panel is a member of the Green Business Partnership, which is really, really exciting. So if you haven't heard of the Green Business Partnership, we were founded in 2009, and the program was born out of the Westchester County Climate Action Plan. I was on the committee in 2007 trying to come up with a green business engagement program for Westchester. And um, so what I learned is, you know, what Maggie was saying is that um, those companies that were really doing it right and really making a difference in sustainability were those that were really driven by employees and green teams and teamwork. So I started my company and I named it Green Team Spirit. And I am not sorry that I did because that name and that spirit has really carried through time and, um, and I know it will continue in the future. So um, the Business Council took us on because this uh, program was started under Andy Spano and it needed a home and so the Business Council um, took us on. So they have a 501c3 within their organization and the Green Business Partnership. We used to be the Westchester Green Business Challenge. We've had five names. Um, I'm sure you have familiar with uh, many of them but the reason that we're now the Green Business Partnership is because we are a national and we took the location out of, out of the, um, that obstacle away. So we are a membership and certification program. And um, so members join and go through a whole process to become certified. They uh, reduce their impact on the environment, they save money, build their business and get recognized. We make a huge deal when a company gets certified. We show up at their place of work. Um, I was talking about you know, Kevin about Sunrise Solar, that we're ready to do that. But what we want to do is when a company gets certified to really use them as the best shining example of what is possible in, the, in their industry. And what we do is we marry the behavioral aspects of going green with the technical. Um, so it's just so, so important that the number one measure is organizational commitment. So we have seven areas of focus, number one being organizational commitment. If the leaders of the organization are not behind it, it's absolutely not going to work. So. What we've, done, what we've done is made it really easy. We write the email that the CEO sends to all staff, rah, rah, we really welcome your participation. This is what we're doing, we value your time. Um, we send out a survey, survey, we've written everything. They can volunteer to be on the green team. And one of the most incredible outcomes of the program that we hear over and over again is the culture change that has happened at, in the workplace. So all of a sudden, people who care about this are working together, and it's become you know, a way for um, employees to engage with each other at all different levels and departments, and um, a whole program for teamwork. We ask that, we actually re require that it's part of HR. When you come to work at that organization, you learn that part of your job is to do your job in the most sustainable way. Um, so right now we have 130 members, 45, 45 of those members are certified, we have, a th we have a big diverse membership. We have Regeneron, we have Montefiore, we have the Crown Plaza is certified through the program for many years. Um, and then we have the Blue Pig Ice Cream. And so we've got you know, or organizations of every size, every type, it doesn't matter as long as you've got a commercial establishment. Um, we can work with you. So what are we doing? We're trying to change what happens inside of the walls of your organization as well as um, we actually don't really care what you do out in the world. I mean we love that you know New Crystal is out there doing like a super green job when there is a disaster and you come with your green cleaning products but even if you didn't you could still get certified because we're certifying what happens inside of your wall. So you're looking at um, energy. How do you use energy? Your water, your waste, transportation, um, land use practices, refrigerants, purchasing. 
So basically what you're doing is, is you're taking a look at every factor that impacts sustainability within the organization and you can get certified um, by doing that. So we have a great relationship with real estate. We have 15 organizations in the program that are either realtors or um, in the building industry or landscape design. And um, so they're, they're a very important part. From the beginning, we have been trying to facilitate landlord and tenant best green practices. So our tenants, in order to get certified, have to find out, you know, what their if they're not sub-metered, what is their portion of the energy bill? What is their portion of the water bill? Sometimes they can't figure it out. We, we facilitate them working with their landlord. You get a prorated number. But there's a lot that tenants can do. And, you know, you might not see the big metrics on you know, what they've done. But, you know, what if they have implemented you know, water saving practices, you know, energy, sh shutting those lights off, you know, shutting down the computers at night, you know, bringing in their own mugs and, you know, um, not using disposables and those kinds of things. Those are great practices, whether or not you can measure them in a big way or not. So we're just constantly playing that game. But real estate and property um, managers and building owners you know, you guys can take this really, really far because implementing these practices at a building level, you know, bringing, you know, focusing on and bringing in renewable energy at the building level, you know, batteries, um, solar, geo, I mean, there's just, that's where we need to go. And I don't usually get on the pulpit, but we are in a really major crisis. So whatever can be done and not being afraid of taking that next step, um, and doing the renewal, and there's money out there, there's you know, nice CERTA, I mean, there's, there's just a way. And if you're trying to figure out a way, you know, you can definitely talk to us. We have all this incredible group of people that are part of our program that we can, um, we can suggest that you speak to. <clears throat> so, let me just see. We have a great internship program. This is something that's really fun. So several years ago, one of the complaints, because it does, it's not easy to get certified through our program. It typically takes a year. And, um, <laughs> and so we have a great internship training program. We match college students from around Westchester and beyond with our company. So we train them on how to get you certified. We put them into your business, your place of business, and they're focused for the summer or whatever time period they're with you is to go grab those energy bills and those water bills and those waste bills and you know, input the data and help you towards certification. And it's a great win-win because these kids have been getting jobs. They're, they're learning about greenhouse gas accounting. And um, it's just been just a fabulous, fabulous program. We do educational events throughout the year. We do four leaders in sustainability speaker series at Westchester Community College. We just had a fabulous guy from IBM speak. In March, um, we had Jones Lang LaSalle on stage last December. And um, so we do that four times a year. For members, we do lunch and learns quarterly. We do industry forums. We've done real estate a couple of times where we bring people around the table who talk about their challenges and opportunities within their industry. And June 11th, if you want another date, <laughs> is the ninth annual Green Business Partnership Awards. So what we do is we celebrate um, our members who have you know, achieved in, in these different categories. River Architects is the big winner of the Charles W. Brown Jr. Sustainability Award in honor of Charlie Brown, who I imagine that many of you remember him. And um, so we give award the, the highest award in his name every year. And River Architects is in Cold Spring or a passive house design architecture firm. So if you don't know them, <clears throat> you should definitely check them out. So that's pretty much what we do. And um, I'm happy to talk to any of you about you know getting involved. We we really need everybody to be a part of this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Really, it's an incredible program. I shouldn't use that word. It's, it's actually fabulous, really it is. So I hope the BRI will be uh, getting on board here soon. Great. <laughs> and our, our next speaker, guest and uh, valued member, Peter Gato. Come on up here. Uh, hello, everybody. Let's see. Thank
Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Jeff and Albert, if you're here. Thanks for setting this up. This is great. Great panel, of course. Uh, it really is an all-star group. Uh, I was going to say something nice about Danny, but she mentioned my comp competition architects. So get, that's all I did. I'm just kidding. So, so I, I, we are a green business uh, partnership uh, participant in the program. It's, it really is fantastic. You should check it out. Uh, so it's it's interesting because the program, as, as anybody here has noticed, it's, it's sort of a it's a recipe to, to you know, green success as, as a kind of the, the general I can categorize it for a second. And then us as architects sort of do the same thing for clients. And it depends where where the the drive comes from. Sometimes it's client driven. Sometimes it's 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 their occupants driven. Sometimes it's uh, economically driven. And sometimes it's um, market driven. So we do all different aspects and figure out what makes sense for, for each client. And really, what it involves is that you know years ago, green building meant just putting a green roof on the building and yeah, look, I have a green building. You know. So there's so many aspects to it that constitute what a green or sustainable building is that it really it, it, it's a it's a unique uh, situation per, per building per project. Whether it's you, you own it, you uh, lease it, you have a tenants, you, you uh, or rent it out, it's, it's a different scenario. Um, and, the, and the caveats with that are really, really you know, catching up to speed in terms of what happens. Years ago there was the LEED certification, I'm sure everybody knows that word LEED, right? So now there's other, there other classifications, other, other ideas to kind of get you through a certification process. So what that's done over the years is really given rise to the, the education of people who want to participate in that idea, or at least understand what that means. The certifications have officially sort of dropped off uh, in terms of registering buildings, but the ideas behind them stand true, and I think because of them, every product and every system and every assembly we, we design and draw is derived from the education to help understand the people when I show them something they they, they comment on understanding as to what that is and what's going to do for them in the future. So it's really exciting. Um, and then in terms of the product itself, you know, so the, the there are a lot of economic incentives out there now. Um, there's other things like you know trying to get off the grid and, and or, or rather be, be neutral in terms of the power supply return. Um, reducing of carbon emissions is a huge one, so those are the sort of the, the ones you find. We're actually doing several projects that are doing great, helping involve water collection. They're just read throughout. We're doing what's called a blue roof. Anybody know what a blue roof is? No. No. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So we're doing a couple of blue roof projects, which is essentially uh, having the roof uh, be structurally designed and, and uh, supporting water collection which should be drained at a much, 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 much slower rate than regular drains coming into the system. So, you know, overburdening the system, which may be overburdened uh, through water discharges, is so definitely a, a very smart way to go as well. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities in different project types and systems that we help people with lots of, uh, all over the place. So it's an admirable uh, notion to have, but the admiration and the altruistic reasons why you do it are also actually we've slipped a few places in terms of why people are seeking um, green uh, sustainable buildings among them is healthy occupants and, and, and client driven and you know that's those sort of things so and that's what we do thank you Um, I'd also point out to you that there are issues of impact on your table, and I did an interview, a lengthy one, with Peter and with Mike Murphy. So if you want to learn more, please uh, take those issues of impact uh, home with you. Uh, it's a lengthy Q&A. And next is Amanda Bailey of Planet Wild. Uh, something very close to my heart here, so I uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. So, <laughs> it's Amanda. <laughs> there we go. Thank God. And I, my company is called Planet Wild. We are not event planners. We are landscape designers and designers and builders of outdoor space. I'm here on the panel to represent the landscaping expert view, especially the sustainable landscaping view. We are in an era of climate change. Uh, that means there's more storms. There's going to be more rain. There's going to be more flooding more hot days, more drought, the sea level is going to rise. That actually means the Hudson River 
and the Long Island Sound are going to actually rise in sea level. We're going to have a lot of flooding. Um, we're going to have to start, you know, looking to renewable sources like wind, sunrise, solar, geothermal, and you know, instead of thinking about the waste stream as just the garbage can done and done, we have to think about you know the whole life cycle of that product. Thank you, Service Master, for saying the word biodegradable. That was great. <laughs> um, and this all relates to this idea of a carbon footprint. So that means, you know, how much carbon dioxide are you putting into the atmosphere? That's your carbon footprint. And once carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, there's no way for it to escape. That's why we have global warming. So there's a lot of things we can do to reduce that carbon footprint and draw down that carbon. And using our landscapes is one of the really great ways to do that. Instead of just thinking about smart buildings and how they're so low energy and how they're powered by renewable, let's think about, you know, that smart building is surrounded by a paved parking lot. <laughs> Not as smart. Let's think about the landscaping around that building and how that can, you know, also be considered your real estate for climate adaptation. So that's where I come in. I was going to go through six tips and tricks for sustainable landscaping and also considering always in the background that we're in a changing climate and that should be top of mind. Um, so think of this as you have, you know, a lot of people in this room have a lot of um, landscapes, a lot of property, maybe executive parks or apartment complexes, what have you. Just think about how to tweak or modify your landscapes in the context of what I'm about to say. Okay, so number one, use what nature has given you. The plants, though not necessarily the invasive ones, and we can have a conversation offline about that for any invasive species people. Um, the existing topography and the views. So let's say preserve existing vegetation you're going to have perhaps a site that you want to develop and there's a lot of mature trees on it, do everything you can to preserve those mature trees. Those trees, the branches, the canopy, the roots are doing so much to absorb not only water but carbon too. So instead of seeing them as just things that are in the way of your driveway, see them as really important features on your site that should be protected and let them do their job. Um, there is also an article about the importance of patches or small areas of you know wooded natural areas and how even those small wooded areas left intact do so much for um, our last you know rare and unusual species. So try to preserve your existing vegetation and your trees and your wooded natural areas. See these as a resource rather than you know undevelopable land, um, which takes me to this other notion of working, an example of working, you know, with what you have on your site. You might have um, really cool rock outcrops that are covered in lawn. Just peel those back and you have this beautiful, just sitting on your site, this beautiful rock outcrop. You might have a wetland that no one really knows how to get to. Let's create a nature trail and, you know, make that a really fun amenity. You might have um, a stream running through your property. Let's let the natural floodplain be intact. Let's restore some plants that attract a lot of local species. So an example of that in Westchester County is the daylighting of the Sawmill River in downtown Yonkers. It was a parking lot that they put over the Sawmill River. They just channeled it and they put it into a pipe and they put it right into the Hudson River. No one even knew there was a river under there. And the town of Yonkers was really innovative in um, peeling back that pavement and revealing this amazing natural amenity right under where all those cars were. And <clears throat> they have had such a success with it that we're now moving on to, I think, even phase four. Um, but they peeled it back and they made this a real draw to downtown Yonkers. Downtown Yonkers is slowly developing. I know, it's getting there, but it's getting there quicker and quicker. We have a new brewery that just opened up there. You know, downtown Yonkers is becoming kind of an exciting place to live. We have, you know, groundwork, Hudson Valley. There's a lot of cool things happening there. And that sawmill river daylight was an example of, you know, creating that energy there. I'm like running out of breath. <laughs> like so excited about this. Can't even help it. Um, okay, number two, 
Don't run off. Retain all of your stormwater on site. This could include a gray system of underground chambers and drains. It can include a green system of planted garden, rain gardens and swales. It could be both of those working together. Whatever it is, just be a really good land steward and capture all of that stormwater and don't let any of it run off from your site boundaries. Just keep it all on site because you're going to really be reducing regional flooding. And again, we have to start thinking this way as we enter or are already in a climate crisis era. It's going to be an original investment to set up that system. But down the line, when all the properties are flooding around you, you where is the water? I don't know. Oh, actually, it's underground in our green and gray infrastructure system. Thank you. <laughs> um, an example of this is the Westchester County Center parking lot in White Plains. They have um, all those grass swale medians in the parking lot that capture the water and direct it into detention wetlands. They also have underground stormwater chambers. Um, so I think that's a really great example of retaining all of your runoff on site. Okay, number three, pave less, which relates to retaining your water on site. We, the water's got to permeate. Where is it going to go? So we just have asphalt surfaces and concrete everywhere. That's not a place for the water to go. So use permeable asphalt, use pavers set in sand, and do whatever you can to let the water permeate. The, an example of this was at the Hastings on Hudson lofts at Saw Mill where they used permeable pavers and it actually was a really nice amenity um, because the pavers have like a nice look to them so you don't have to do all of your asphalt replaced with permeable you could just even do you know certain amenities replace it but start somewhere um, okay. two more number four is to use native plants choose native plants as they are low maintenance and drought tolerant everyone throws around this word native does that does everyone in this room know the word native? Like, does that ring a bell? Because <laughs> perhaps five years ago it did. So there is this movement called the native plant movement, which is why Planet Wild is so successful, because people are wanting to use native plants. The word native, what does this mean? It's a plant that reproduces on its own without intervention. A native plant survives with minimal human care. There's no need for fertilization. There's no need for pruning. You don't have to use pesticides or herbicides with native plants. Uh, native plants have co-evolved co with other plants and animals in the region. So, for example, you have flowers that have pollen and nectar. Bees need the pollen and nectar. That, and that's how the plants can reproduce. That's a co-evolved relationship that took thousands of years to develop. So when we use native plants, we have a pretty good uh, assurance that we're going to be helping a wide diversity of other species with all these interrelationships that have developed over many, many years. In traditional landscaping, perhaps in a lot of the commercial properties I see in Westchester, it's the same non-native plants used over and over again. We can do better than that. I'm not even saying, like, we can just switch out a boxwood and put an inkberry. We can, um, switch out a forsythia and use a spice bush. The forsythia is the yellow one flowering right now. We have a native alternative for nearly every plant. Let's just start with switching those out. If you want to take it a step further, think of the highland. Think of the massings and the layered, you know, from the ground cover up through the canopy. Think of that look. Think about how modern and new your building will be, how much your tenants will love it. If you have this new, like, sustainable landscape in front greeting you every single time that you come and go, um, and made of native plants. So, okay, so a great example of this is Terrytown, the Terrytown train station um, that was done by, I think it was the developer National Resources in Tanamastina Hudson, Friends of the River Walk Terrytown, the village of Terrytown in Westchester County have have gotten together and made this beautiful outdoor space. I, I recommend everyone in this room go perhaps in June, take a walk. There's a really good restaurant called the River Market. You got you got a date. Like that's date night just. <laughs> okay. Uh, number five. Go green without the lawn. Okay, I'm not gonna um, totally bash lawns 
out, right? <laughs> I enjoy lawns to picnic on, I like throwing a ball around. It's nice to have like a nice open space, but there's just too much lawn. There's just too much lawn in Westchester. So what I'm promoting is that we reduce the amount of lawn in our open spaces. Lawns, I mean, the, the, the mowers emit a lot of carbon emissions, so that's not really going to bring down your carbon footprint if you're trying to be sustainable. Um, they have fertilizer that they need, then all that fertilizer is run off into our waterways, and that's why we have algae blooms in our lakes. Um, and they use a cocktail of toxic pesticides to maintain them. I think a lot of you already know the bad things about lawn, I won't keep going on. Um, so if you can limit your areas of lawn or just reduce the size of them, that's great. And this is why Planet Wild, my company, is different from your conventional landscaping company. Lawn care is a multi-billion dollar industry. And here I am saying it needs a do-over. I mean, it must be crazy. <laughs> the traditional model, though, depends on that mow and that blow. It's for, and for this to happen over and over again. So, why I'm proposing that we reduce lawn areas, I, I do understand this need that there has to be a shift. Like, how is this really going to happen, like on the ground? So I have an idea that um, how the lawn care crew could transition into doing this kind of more native and sustainable kind of work instead of the mow and blow. So very quickly, native plant plugs are small baby plants. They're small, they're easy to plant, they're a lot cheaper than the standard size at the nursery. We use plugs all the time when I did habitat restorations at the New York City Parks Department, restoring wetlands and natural areas. Okay, so you have this idea of this plug. The mown, crow, the mown blow crew is at your property. This crew, though, happens to be Team Go Green, and they were trained by Planet Wild and how to replace lawn areas with native plant plugs. So every week that Go Green team shows up at your property, that's fine. Someone's going to be over there mowing the lawn. That's fine. But this team, this, these guys over here, are going to take this you know, half of here and cover it with a weed barrier, a biodegradable weed barrier, and then plant plugs in this, this rectangle. They're just going to do, like say, 500 square feet. And they're going to do that, say, once a month. So by the end of the year, they keep adding, they keep adding, they keep adding, less mowing, and then you have more native plants, less lawn, they're still, everyone's still working, everyone still has jobs. Um, so that's just something to consider to, you know, break through the, the traditional mow and blow uh, landscape model. One more thing, uh, number six is don't pollute the airwaves. We're seeing a lot of leaf blower bans happening across towns in Westchester. Um, people, yeah, people want it quiet on the weekends especially. You know, it, you work so hard and you live in this suburb because it's beautiful. And you want to live in nature and they're hearing like, or, you know, the sound of some blower going. And let's, let's quiet it down. Like, instead of blowing the leaves into garbage bags that we then go and take to landfill, just leave the leaves in place on your planting bed. Leave them there. That's perfect habitat for so many species. If there's leaves that are falling in your lawn, leave them there too, but mulch them in place, and that's organic fertilizer. You just you haven't even spent money on any organic thing. You already have it on your site, so make use of it. Um, Pace University in Pleasantville, they don't water or fertilize their lawns, and they compost all their leaves on site. So in closing, by designing with nature in your landscape, you can achieve a lot of positive things. Come talk to me after if you're interested in figuring out some ideas that we could do on your property. Um, I'm going to be at the New York Sustainable Energy Conference and Trade Show April 24th, and I thought people in this room, especially those that showed up to attend this really great panel on green, you know, sustainable practices, would be interested in this conference. Um, so it's at the Double Tree Hilton Terrytown April 24th. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I just want to mention the Arbor Day Foundation, right? If you've joined the Arbor Day Foundation, which has been around for decades, uh, for very little money annually, they will send you 10 trees, which look like sticks, you know, they're just seedlings, but you plant them and you start growing 10 trees uh, if you have the room. So anyway, thank you again. And Michael Murphy, delighted to work.
see you here with us. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, the bar is still open for all you intrepid. If you're going up to the bar, the two white wines, a red wine, and a vodka at the end of it, please. Okay, yep. Uh, and uh, she, Maggie did mention that there's an article in the Impact on your table there that uh, is an article about Peter and myself there. We're going to be up here for autographs after. Right, Peter? Right. No charge, just an autograph. That's it. Thank you all for coming here. The reason why the, this panel is going on right now is because in the month of April, we celebrate Earth Day. You know, Earth Day is going to be, I think it's uh, April 22nd, it's the 49th anniversary of Earth Day, and uh, that's why we have panels like this. And the interesting thing about Earth Day was it was started during the Nixon administration. So it doesn't matter when these things happen, good things happen at all times, just when people have the, the uh, in inclination to do something about it. Like people up here and you here, we're glad that you're all here today to hear us speak. Now, uh, I'm with Murphy Brothers Contracting. We're contractors. We're the grunts on the ground that build things. The grunts, right, Eric? That's it. We build things. So people say, you know, we, they said, you, uh, what do we know about green building? Ten years ago, they said, green building. We thought, hey, we're Murphy Brothers. Of course, we build green, right? <laughs> so uh, we were doing the, uh, the Dream Home for Westchester Magazine in 2009. We started doing the project, and they said, so tell us what's going to be green about this project. And we thought, Murphy Bros is building this, it's got to be green, right? No, 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 they wanted to know what was energy efficient. So we had to go through this pro had a learning process, this learning curve was very steep for us, and it was uh, quite a learning experience. For that project there, it was like the start of us, you know, in this quest to, to develop the philosophy that we have in, the company that, uh, in our company that Maggie had mentioned that building green is simply building smart. And as contractors or grunts, we want to seem like we're at least a little bit smart. So we have this philosophy about building green is building smart. That particular project was the first NAHB, which is the National Association of Home Builders, uh, gold certified home, as homes, get, you know, homes and buildings get certified. We also went on to build the first single family gold lead project in Westchester County. And currently we're working on a project which is going to be the first Fitwell certification in Westchester County. Now Fitwell is a new building model certification which is uh, huge over in other parts of the country and is relatively new in this country here. So I won't take up a lot of your time right over here now. Uh, I know you want to get to questions because this is a panel and panel is all about questions, right? So but I do want to say that you know technology is changing. One thing is not changing and that's the cost of energy. It's always going up. So we have to be concerned about energy efficiency. It goes in hand in hand with environmental responsibility. So thank you for being here. Hope you enjoy the rest of the panel. Maggie. walk around with the microphone if there are any questions. I have the first question, if you don't mind. I wanted to ask um, any of you, all of you, about green roofs and if that's going on in New York City. I've been reading articles about this and seeing them and it sounds like something fabulous. Can anyone address this business of literally planting a green roof? Uh, yeah, but there's, there's definitely some. Um, we're doing a few in Brooklyn, one in Lower Manhattan. Um, it's 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 uh you know it's there's two a couple of different types so one you have to understand what it is but it's, it's something you have to plan in the beginning because you can't really do it after the fact that's something they can tell you so if you want to do it uh structurally drainage wise a lot of details that go with it okay he says not true you think, you think I, well, anything's i'll i'll, I'll prep as long as the here. structural is adequate you could do it that's right. happening already in brooklyn there have been uh well, let me just say this. Opening farms. That's correct. The okay. Barclays Center has a green yeah, it? That was an after the market fact, and it was a very costly endeavor, and it's already dead. So that, that's, let's talk about that in a second. Um, so uh, after the fact, it's totally possible. It just costs more money. I'll, I'll, I'll preface it that way. Um, you're welcome. So um, it's, it's not going on. It's, it's uh, yes, it's still uh, okay. going. Okay. Can I, so I, I add to that about the green? So I'm actually a fan of the blue roof over the green roof because Peter just mentioned how costly a green roof is. Let's even just start with like reducing your lawn at the ground level. I think that people are like really wanting green roofs, but they're really expensive and it takes a lot to get them all the plants up there and just something to think about. And to Amanda's point, sorry, one more thing, is that, is that there are a lot of times the green roofs are coming in or for, for staggered uh, setups where windows don't want to look down on a roof or air conditioning equipment or what, what it may be, so they will plant a green roof around to make it less 
um, <clears throat> visual, a bit more visual uh, and pleasing. So I think, uh, to what you were saying before, I'm seeing a lot of native and tall grasses growing up around there. They kind of it's actually it's actually screaming equipment, and it is less yeah. um, invasive, less deep, and, and it's a different approach, but it's also equally nice. Interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Question from Silvio yeah. Solari, AOAC. Thank you. I don't think I need a mic, but uh, there's a building going up in Mount Vernon right now, 42 West Broad, and by looking at it. It has, first of all, it has gotten no attention from anybody, not even the media, but I think it's going to be one of the greenest buildings in Westchester. Uh, the builder is predicting that the savings will be 90% after they put all the systems in place, be 90% efficient. Uh, one of the systems they're putting in place, which I thought was quite unique, was cogeneration. They're going to have a generator in the building, which will generate electricity, and the heat from the generator will be used to heat the hot water and heat the building. They're predicting a comparable building, they will use 10% of the energy of a comparable building. The question is, is that possible to achieve 90% efficiency? And what do you think about cogeneration? Well, with cogeneration, we've done a number of cogeneration on the residential side. Again, this is like, it's a great idea, but uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but cogeneration runs off of natural gas. So sure. Sure. natural gas, you have a natural gas moratorium. So if you want to do natural gas in your building, think again. You're not well, going to do he's it. Already has the he has the approval. He has the approval for that. Unfortunately, yeah. you can't do it down here. Yeah. Unless it's right. interruptible. Well, there's, there's an exception there. If it's interruptible, if you get an interruptible sure. line, then you yeah. can do it. You have to have another alternative fuel. Yeah. Right, that's the problem with all of them. And green energies, they don't work 24 7. They're not well, base load. The other part of the question is it possible to achieve 90%? I yeah. mean, yeah, in theory, yeah, it's usually not one item that does no, the it's offset, not. it's a combination of things. So, solar does some element, uh, geothermal, we're doing a lot of buildings now because of the moratorium. Um, that's another element that can offset certain things. Um, so you have a combination of items that work together as, as a system. So not one product is going to solve all that, but yeah, the, a lot of the numbers are, are slanting towards it. And I think in the next 10 years, you'll see a lot more projects uh, aiming towards 90% or you know efficiency rates. So there's stuff for getting there. Go ahead, Jack. All right. I wanted to just comment on the green roof. If you have a question. I've been involved in projects with green roofs. And one of the, I couldn't hear, so maybe you said it, but <clears throat> one of the advantages of these green roofs was there's a special type of plant that's called cedar um, that we used in it. And you don't have to really do anything to maintain it. It's it, it like the wild type of plant. I talked to Matt that we were talking about all day. Um, the advantage of this building to high rise is that it makes the building uh, cooler because the roofs get very hot when the sun goes directly on the roof. So now it hits the plants instead of the roof. So it, it's a natural coolant. And also it catches the water. So instead of the water hitting the roof and running off into the environment, it's going into the plants. So those are the real nice advantages of the green, of the green roof, in my experience. And it does work, we've seen. I've also been involved in some cogeneration projects, and there has been a couple of our buildings that I manage, and there's been some substantial savings from the co-generation projects, I have to say. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know where to go first. We'll go to Amy Cohen first. Uh, this is a question for Amanda. Um, you have wonderful ideas, but I have a question which I think you've thought about, which is how do you um, train or get the lawn maintenance companies trained to be amenable to your ideas? Right. So, I have an idea for that. Um, and I want to actually host a conference, I think we've talked about this, where, because I think that a lot of people, a lot of those crews want to do this, but they just don't have the tools or the educational background to do it. And I think having a one-day workshop where Planet Wild invites, you know, Westchester landscaping crews to come and learn how to do this new native plant kind of maintenance could be really successful. Plus, I can learn from who attends who I'd like to work with Planet Wild on a more regular basis. Um, so that's one angle to answer that. And part two is the asphalt people. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, let's get, talk about get, the app. Get them on, uh, figure, figure out how to, how to do permeable. Sets. There you go. There's lots of, op I keep, keep, there's lots of options for that. I mean, it's, a, it's key because you have great ideas, but you have to get the people managed. Exactly. That's why I, I tested out with this crowd that idea of like the reducing the lawn with a native plant plug. What do you, <coughs> or with a raise of hand, does anyone think that's a good idea or is that kind of? All right, yeah. let's try that. I think that could be really a great way to go at changing that low and blow model. Caesar Manfredi of our co-op and condo board is next. Yes, I'm president of a co-op in Irvington. Uh, on the native plant plugs, I mean, what are they? I mean, are they specific? A specific native plant, or it's potluck when you buy one, and where do you buy them? All, yeah, great. All is is and size. also, do they grow in a, in a steep hill where grass doesn't grow? Yes. Because it just the grass dies and the mud goes on the sidewalk. Okay, so first part, plug is just the size. It, all it is is referring to the size of that plant. Right, so I know is, that. Yeah. So you can get a plug of any native plant that you want. So what? Plant? How do you know which one to pick? Um. Oh, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm a landscape designer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we know our plants and we know, okay, we're going to look at your sun. We're going to look at how shady or sunny is it. Is it clayey? How quickly does the water drain? Are you on a slope? Who's using the space? What are the plants are growing there? I'm sure you have a deer problem. I'm sure you, no one has time to maintain it. So we think of all of these different things and, you know, seasonality. And we come up with a customized, you know, problem-solving landscape plan for your property. I got it. Okay. And I like I, the Let plug. Me, one of our Cheryl's is a landscape uh, person, expert uh, arborist, I guess you call it. So that now how. One one thing to be clear though, the plugs though, I just said every native plant, which they could, like you have saplings of the trees, but the plugs are primarily your herbaceous material, so your grasses and your flowers. Just right. I'm not looking for. Trees. We're just looking We're for on the same ground page. cover. Perfect. <laughs> Hang with us. We're going to get the next question in a few seconds. Jean Duresta, AOAC. Good evening. Uh, two things. You don't need plugs. Let the grass grow by itself. Birds, the wind, will inoculate it with wild vegetation all by itself. I I've done that. I, no? I'll let you finish and then I'm going to no, react. come to my house and you'll see that you're wrong. I want to react. So that's, I've done this now 20 years. My neighbors are, are infuriated because they hate the uh, dandelions. Okay. Right? So that, that's how I've been doing it for about 20 years. Okay. It works well. The other thing is with regard to the roofs, <coughs> whether it be green or blue, let me propose a very simple alternative to either of those two. Make it reflective white so that the solar radiation bounces back, which is what's really needed in terms of reducing the heat input into the earth. White roofs, reflective components within tar. This is really what's necessary. When you look at atmospheric thermodynamics, which is really the governing relationships. You want to bounce the heat back into the atmosphere instead of capturing it. That's how the physics is going to solve or at least attempt to mitigate the problems that we're experiencing. Bounce the radiation back into outer space. Thank you, Jean. Amanda, did you want to respond? I was just going to say that I love the plugs, no matter, even if you're 20 years of experience. I love them because it gives the natives a head start. Because what happens is that when you grow that grass, you're going to have a lot of invasives coming in. And what happens is that you have a monoculture of invasives. And we really want to add to the biodiversity. And when you plant with a plug, it gives it a head start. That, that was my response. Birds. I'd, I'd like to, if you don't mind me, I'd like to respond to Gene just to say that this is interesting. You see, this is what's happening in the, the building fields. It used to be just accepted, this is the way it was. Everybody does same old roof, same old door, same old window, same old tile, same old everything. Running business is the same way, but now everything's up for grabs. Yeah. And, and we're learning that some things are good, and some things are really good, and some things aren't so good. And some things are so, good and cheap, yeah. and you can so, change 
an existing structure by just putting a white roof on it. When it's time to change the tiles, instead of going with sexy brown or speckled tiles, put white. <laughs> okay, we have a question here, Maggie. Hi, I'm Maria Carso. Um, I'm on the Committee for the Environment. I'm a Maronick. And I, I, I don't know, we've tried with the landscapers and the leaf blowing and you know, finding them, and I, I don't find that that's a solution. I think we need like a broad, like homeowners need to just draw the line. And do you have any programs like that where you can reach large amount of homeowners? You know, because I think that's where it's going to make the difference. They're making the money, they get a fine, the owner pays it, it's a slap on the wrist, and it just doesn't work. Absolutely. You know, so we need like massive education, like how do you get in front of more I think um, we'll leave leaves alone. I mean, there's, there's, you know, this was done several, several years ago. I mean, probably at least eight years ago. There's all these videos online. Um, I think it was Hastings, but there's a. So not only did they produce these videos in English, they produced them in Spanish. So there's actually this whole teaching module. I could go back and try and find it. But um, there's a lot of Westchester communities that are following those practices. I mean, I personally had that conversation many years ago with the person who does my landscaping, and I've got my lawn is just crabgrass, but it's fine, and it, it's everything is mulched and kind of wild. And Amanda planted a little um, garden in my owners to give up that green grass. But I wish I wish someone would talk to my next door neighbor because talk about that noise. I mean, the entire weekend it's a mm, and it, it drives us crazy. Yeah, we find that it's not so much the noise; it's more the pollution that really yeah. that it creates that people don't yeah. realize it's yeah. massive, like you know, yeah. amounts of pollution. And I think also people are seeing those little yellow signs on lawns. You know, with, you know, this is toxic, and how we're seeing a lawsuit against Roundup Monsanto, and how these typical way of maintaining a lawn is causing cancer and all kinds of stuff that I think going after the health aspect even more so the, the environmental aspect is what works in, on a large piece. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? Going once, twice, three times? I think Maggie has something to say. I think I have the last question. Uh, and let's, I, I don't want to move from outside to inside, but I must. Uh, um, I'd rather stay outside uh, on all of these things. Um, remember, we used to talk about and hear a lot about sick buildings, and I think there are still sick buildings. And I just wonder if you guys and gals uh, have any thoughts about this business of sick buildings. Um, had some anecdotal stories lately about people who have gotten certain illnesses um, in the same building, strangely. They're still sick buildings, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, really what happens is when, when, you, when um, you know, they're around for a long time, and now they're, 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 health is a huge aspect for everything. So from the products mentioned by Robert before, the, 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 the cleaning of the grasses and such, and the, the chemicals, and buildings, you know, there's certain things that carry and can, and, and, uh, can uh, not make a building sick. So we're getting better with the, the carpets, we're getting better with the product, the materials, but still water and the HVAC system is really the, one of the barriers. So what's coming with that? Two things are happening. One is the maintenance program is being ineffective. I'm sure Michael speak to this too, that you know, it, the routine explanation of, of, of or knowing where to change certain filters, doing certain things. So it's, it's just regular maintenance. You take care of your car, go to the dentist. It's the same thing for a building. You have to maintain it. And the second thing that's happening is technology is also coming in with it. So there's a lot of uh, BMS building maintenance systems which come in and that there's constant monitoring. So it's, uh, it's, you do it from your from home, from your iPad, or your phone, or, um, and there's ways to check in and ch check on the air quality of the building, as well as what's happening with, with, with routine maintenance. Um, if anybody's a member of, uh, a lot of any facilities people understand this because you constantly keep, keep a check of things. It's not just making sure what light bulbs are out, what light bulbs are, un, are, are not working, or what doorknobs are on leaky faucets, but a lot of this, things you can't see. And that's where the healthy buildings issue comes in. So if you know you have to change certain things, just make it a routine, change your filter, change this, it becomes part of your, your uh, monthly, quarterly setup. And then if you, even if you forget, you have a BMS system which ties into all this, and it, and it is a, a spreadsheet and technology can help you do that. So 
that's that's a big improvement the past bunch of years. On on new construction, if you build a super tight building, super insulated, you're going to have a sick building if you don't have a proper ventilation system. That's up to the architect. So no, really, it is up to the architect because like, are there any other contractors in here besides myself and Eric? Oh, okay. So we know that the architect specs it. We put it in there. Usually, we work with guys like like uh, Peter that'll specify that. But you're right. But actually, what happens is like when, before we turn a building over, I know Eric does the same thing. We give the client, we walk the client through it, tell them how the house operates. We give them all the information, you know, so they they know at least they know up front how the system works. Then we're only a phone call away when things go wrong. So. We have one final question from Carrie Hollander of A.J. Williams of Pelham. Thank you. I don't have to introduce myself. Uh, I have a question. It's basically based on ignorance, but it has to do with geothermal. Is there any negative impact to the environment with doing geothermal? I'm, I'm envisioning like a subdivision that does it all, and maybe you have 200 homes, each with geothermal. So that's one question. And the other is, what's the lifespan of a geothermal system? I don't know actually the specifics about geothermal yet and how it harms the environment. I mean, you know, everyone has some kind of drawback. Solar, you have to, you might have to cut down trees. Um, geothermal, I don't. I, I would think just, it's pretty minimal. Um, I mean, I think there is some disruption, however many feet down, and maybe it could. But it, you know, it's not like fracking and causing earthquakes yeah. or anything. So I think that the. Right, if, you, if, you, if you're drilling in a 200 home system or uh, community, and I mean, you might wake up Godzilla, but it should be all right. Uh, it's really negligible. I mean, you, you either go straight down, straight out, there's a ratio of depth to, to height, so, um, and, and the Earth's atmosphere, you go down the same distance here, you know, 10 million miles, 10,000 miles away, it's the same temperature. So it's picking up the same Earth and, and the same temperature, and it's really, it's a, it's a great system once it's going. I mean, uh, New York State is now, um, with the heat pumps, I mean, New York State is really pushing geothermal mm -hmm. and subsidizing um, geothermal in a huge way yep. right now. Actually, the conference that Amanda yep. mentioned, there's going to be a lot of talk about that. And there's one yes. called Dandelion, which is like this Google spinoff for geothermal, and it's supposed to be more affordable, really nimble to put in different environments. I'm, yeah, I'm sure they'll be there. Thank you. Well, I think that's it, and thank you so much. We hope to see you at next month's general membership meeting on May 22nd, and please join us on April 26th for the 40th anniversary of the Co-op Condo Council. Have a great night. Safe home, everyone.